morning. We will uh, call to order today's Board of Commissioners meeting. I'd like everybody to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Let me begin by noting that there's a copy of the Open Meetings Act on the north wall of the legislative chambers. Also, um, there is on the back wall an automatic defibrillator if anybody needs that for health reasons. And if you have a cell phone, I'd ask you to please silence it or put it on mute. Uh, before we call to order the board equalization, we now turn over to Commissioner Borgs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to mention two things that have come to our attention. Um, that we're celebrating and the first one um, which isn't up there yet but is the National Organization of Disorders for the Corpus um, Callosum. Um, Larry Storr sent this to us and thought it because it was this week in recognition of this that it would be nice to um, mention it in our meetings and down at the legislature today. So. The Brain Awareness Week is a global campaign to increase public awareness of the progress and benefits of brain research. For one week, beginning March 11th, organizations from around the world celebrate the brain with unique programs, events, and messages. The NODCC will conduct a social media campaign, primarily on Facebook, to share information about the corpus callosum, its role in the brain, and the challenges of those living without this important pathway. We invite you to share the content, join the discussion, and help spread the message to help the Corpus Callosum become a household name. The people understand the role of the, of the Corpus Callosum and more acceptance and awareness we can create for this disorder. Uh, the second one uh, was brought to Commissioner Rogers and I attention yesterday. And uh, the, uh, you can't really read that, but it's the uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority is offering free mammograms. And I just wanted to give you a couple of statistics um, as to why this is so important and we're very excited for this mobile um, mammogram clinic to be rolling into our community. About one in eight U.S. women, about 12%, will develop in invasive breast cancer over the course of her lifetime. In 2019, an estimated 268 1,600 new cases of invasive, invasive breast cancer are expected to be diagnosed in women in the U.S., along with 62,930 new cases of non-invasive breast cancer. About 2,670 new cases of invasive, invasive breast cancer are expected to be diagnosed in men in 2019. A man's lifetime risk of breast cancer is about one to one in 183. About 41,760 women in the U.S. are expected to die in 2019 from breast, breast cancer. Though death rates have been decreasing since 1989, women under 50 have experienced larger decreases. These decreases are thought to be the result of treatment advances, early detection through screening, and increased awareness. In women under 45, breast cancer is more common in African-American women than white women. Overall, African-American women are more likely to die of breast cancer. For Asian, Hispanic, and Native American women, the risk of developing and dying from breast cancer is lower. And then finally, as of January 2019, there are more than 3.1 million women with a history of breast cancer in the U.S. This includes women currently being treated and women who are finished, who have finished their treatment. And so Saturday, March 16th, from 8 to 5, down at the Hilton Omaha uh, 1001 Cass Street, this mobile clinic will be there to provide mammograms to the community. And so whatever we can do to get the word out, um, to let folks know that it's there, um, please help get the word out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll call to order the Board of Equalization meeting. Roll call, please. Commissioner Borgeson? Here. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Here. Commissioner Duda? Here. Commissioner Kraft? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. Uh, item A is approval of the minutes of the Board of Equalization meeting held Tuesday, February 26, 2019. And item B is call for a meeting at set Tuesday, March 19, 2019, as the date for hearing on certified assessments and corrections. What's the will of the board? Mo motion by Commissioner Duda, second by Commissioner Boyle. Please vote. 
Just a reminder, Commissioner Boyle's vote will not appear on the screen, but he does vote yes, as do the rest of the commissioners. Motion passes. Um, item C is citizens' comments. This is an opportunity for citizens to comment on Board of Equalization related items not officially listed on the agenda. Are there any citizens' comments at this time? Say none. Uh, we will go to the resolutions. Uh, resolutions D, E, F, and G are there. Note that there is a replacement at your desk for uh, item D uh, on the agenda. Uh, what's the will of the board for those items? Motion to approve. Um, motion to approve by Second. Commissioner Boyle. Seconded by Commission. Commissioner Morgan. Does that include adjournment? Yes, it does. Commissioner Cavanaugh. I just have one quick question on uh, item G, and I think uh, Mr. Cavanaugh is here from the Treasurer's Office regarding a Treasurer's recommendation to deny the application for a vehicle tax exempt status. I, I, I don't have any question about this, but it's an interesting rule, and maybe you could share with us the, the reasoning behind this. Morning, Commissioners. Morning. Tim Cavanaugh, um, Treasurer's Office. We recommend denial of this application because the applicant. Uh, Who's asking for this exemption? The, the vehicle is registered in their own name. You can't do that. It has to be registered in the nonprofit's name in order to qualify for tax exempt status. No reflection on the service they provide or the organization. It's just that it is registered in an individual's name. Any questions? No. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's a um, motion and a second to approve items D, E, F, G, and adjourn. Please vote. Motion passes 7 to 0. We'll now call to order the Douglas County Board of Corrections meeting. Roll call, please. Commissioner Borgeson? Here. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Here. Commissioner Duda? Here. Commissioner Kraft? Commissioner Morgan? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. Uh, item 1 is approval of the minutes of the Board of Corrections meeting held Tuesday, February 12, 2019. Is the will of the Board? Motion by Commissioner Borgeson, seconded by Commissioner Boyle. Please vote. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item two, citizens' comments. This is an opportunity to comment on Board of Corrections related items not on the agenda today. Is there any citizens' comments? Seeing none. Item three, Director Myers. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Michael Myers, the um, Director of the Department of Corrections. Uh, you have before you the re uh, Board of Corrections report for the month of February. Uh, following the eighth month of the fiscal year, we are over budget. Um, we met with Joe Lorenz recently, and our adjustment to our budget um, based upon our actual cost for the year uh, will be uh, submitted to you next week for your approval. Um, on a positive budgetary note, we are still tracking ahead of our revenue um, projections for the fiscal year. Enclosure number two, community corrections. Uh, 11 individuals were housed in the sanction center in February for a total of 55 days. Uh, we had another 11 individuals who were housed in the transitional discharge center uh, for a total of 44 bed days. Uh, just a reminder, those are two new approaches that we've started in recent months to attempt to divert some of the population from um, the secure jail over to the, uh, the work release center. Um, the Department of Corrections scheduled its second ever GED graduation ceremony. That actually happened um, last Friday. Uh, it was a very, um, very touching event, uh, a lot of uh, great accomplishments. The families were very, very grateful for us giving them that opportunity. Thank you for, to Commissioner Boyle for um, his presence and, and speaking to the graduates. Um, they, I had several of them and the family members approached me afterwards to express their gratitude to you. There were nine that were wow. present, but there were actually additional ones that, you know, were unable to attend. Nice. So um, there were nine graduates present. So it was a very, a very good deal for us. Um, to further de development of, of a recovery or addiction services in the jail, um, we are collaborating with the Community Mental Health Center uh, on writing a federal grant through the SAMHSA um, administration 
to, um, to basically replicate an intensive outpatient treatment program that we have in community corrections inside of the jail. Uh, it is our hope to have uh, that program, or to ha eventually have a one, two programs, one for men and one for women, operating inside of the jail. And whether, we, whether this grant application is successful um, or not, it is our intent, uh, we will continue to develop services um, around uh, substance abuse in the jail as well. This is just a vehicle to ramp it up um, much more robustly and much more quickly. 24-7 uh, sobriety had 47 admissions in, in February. There were 2,611 breath tests. We did, as you know, our weather was quite challenging in February, so we did have several incidences where we did have to cancel testing just in the interest of safety. Uh, seven tests were positive for alcohol use. There were zero no-shows and a very good month for compliance for breath testing at 99.8%. 98, uh, 32 individuals were monitored for a total of 755 scram days of monitoring. Uh, there were zero no-shows, zero tampering, and two alcohol violations. Again, that compliance rate was also 99.8%. Uh, there were 321 saliva um, drug tests administered, eight positive tests, and there were five no-shows. Uh, we had 11 drug testing patches that were submitted uh, for testing, and there were three violations. Uh, work release admitted 27 individuals in February. House arrest admitted 58. The reentry assistance program admitted 14. 50 individuals uh, were admitted to uh, programs in the jail during February. And the Universal Peace Foundation of North America began offering um, yoga services to men and women in the jail in February, following up on a pilot that we ran with that organization last year. Uh, 10 individuals were referred for, to priority prosecution. 75 bed days were saved. Um, 221 individuals were placed on pretrial release. And in total, 1,145 individuals were monitored on pretrial release with a 92% compliance rate. Uh, we are in the midst of collecting our second year of data collection for our audit cycle for ACA. Um, and we will have our second ever PREA audit uh, the first week of May. And PREA, um, for those who are unfamiliar with the acronym, is the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Uh, interviews are ongoing for new correctional officers. I'm sorry, I'm moving on to enclosure number four personnel. Um, the next class of officers actually began yesterday. Um, this class ended up being a little smaller than what we projected a few weeks ago for a variety of reasons. When I, that became clear to me, I knew that we needed to continue to adapt and respond. Um, so we, I challenged the training department to come up with a scenario where they could run overlapping training classes. Uh, they've accepted that challenge. We'll have a second class to begin um, in early April. Um, basically, how they will do that is week four or five of the first of the class that started yesterday's curriculum will be week one um, for the class that will join them in April. Uh, it's very important to me that we give relief to our officers um, who've been subjected to basically years now of mandatory overtime. So um, we're going to continue to try to refine our efforts of recruiting and hiring um, and accelerate that process and then continue to beef up our efforts to keep folks once we have them. <clears throat> um, I'd like to congratulate Heather Yostin, who was promoted to the rank of sergeant in February. And we wish Sergeant Samuel Ross the best as he retired in February. Um, we started a, a new men staff mentoring, new officer mentoring and, de and development program um, with the, the last class that graduated. Um, <coughs> They hit the, the floors in January, and it's a little early for me to call it a success yet, but the early indications, both verbally and the data, are very promising. 100% uh, of those officers are still employed. Uh, they've been working on their own now for a couple of months. Uh, they meet with a mentoring officer twice a week. They meet with their sergeant uh, about on a weekly basis. Um, we're going to continue that focus and expand that program. Um, 
to improve upon the <coughs> excuse me that our retention that um, for new officers which wasn't very encouraging in 2018 um, to get off this sort of hamster wheel of constantly hiring and replacing people that that's really where our focus needs to be is making sure that we do a good job of developing those officers and getting them the skills and support that they need to uh, maintain their employment in, in a new and challenging profession for them. Um, <clears throat> also, in an effort to continue to instill a stronger sense of welcoming and support to newer officers, I've directed that all lieutenants will attend um, new hire, the New Hire Academy at one point or another, um, introducing themselves, getting to know the, the new recruits, um, as they go through training, um, the more familiar faces and support that those new new officers can get throughout the ranks, I think, will be critical to improving that goal of staff retention. Uh, moving on to enclosure number five, population. <clears throat> um, we a little bit of good news for February, partially uh, maybe also related to the the poor weather that we that we all endured. Um, there, if there is any silver lining in that, it's that fewer people tend to come to jail during um, bad weather. Um, we had 1,281 admissions in February, which is probably over 400 less than we had the previous month, to put that into perspective. Uh, we released 1,320. Uh, our high count was 1,293. Our low count was 1,242. Um, our average daily population was 1,267, which is approximately 35 less than we had the previous month. Um, custodial uh, sanctioned bed days were 311. Uh, the U.S. Marshal population increased a little bit. The ICE population decreased slightly. The felony pretrial population decreased. The misdemeanor pretrial population decreased and the female population decreased somewhat, uh, but we still maintained three or four housing units open for females based upon how many were there on any given day during the month. Enclosure number six, medical. Uh, we had 1,459 screenings. There were 520 physical and health assessments. Enclosure number seven, mental health. There were 151 initial psychiatric appointments. Um, there were 221 mental health assessments. You will see probably, especially those mental health assessments, those numbers trend upward as we engage in the new contract. There are additional resources placed towards mental health. Uh, so there we, I would expect to see um, more activity given that there's a couple of more um, mental health practitioners uh, on staff. There are 53 mental health infirmary placements. Um, referrals to um, the Board of Mental Health, where there were four, and there were two long-term psychiatric facility referrals. Um, other noteworthy items, although I announced this last month, um, it officially did happen in February, so I'll recognize it again. Uh, Amber Redmond was promoted to Deputy Director in February. Uh, also, Debbie Otwell, this is actually a March item. Um, she assumed the role of Amber's former job of Administrative Services Manager uh, taking over yesterday. Um, and we had a initial planning session conducted with um, to refine our process for re selecting sp staff for specialty positions. We have a lot of unique assignments to carry on the day-to-day -day business of the jail. There's been a lot of processes that evolved kind of separately over time. Um, which has kind of led to some confusion for some folks as how, how does some per person get into a particular role um, if they wish to pursue it. So we're working on standardizing that to have a very fair, clear process that everyone uh, um, has a, uh, a shout to, uh, to pursue if they wish. A couple other things that I failed to put in my report that I want to mention. Um, Chris Sweeney, our accreditation compliance manager, he was elected um, as a national election through the American Correctional Association. He was elected to the uh, Commission on Accreditation. Um, so he will be um, serving in that role for the next few years for the American Correctional Association, um, assessing other agencies' um, uh, applications for accreditation. So congratulations to Chris on that national honor. Um, and Sergeant John Gannett um, had his 30th anniversary 
of employment with, uh, with the Douglas County Department of Corrections. That's a pretty remarkable milestone as well. And I, I will wrap up my report um, with um, a letter that we received. Um, and I get to see a lot of really neat things that our staff do on a regular basis. Um, you know, the jail, you know, our, by the nature of what we do, we don't always get cast in the, the most positive light in the community. And I want to make sure that I give, you know, my attempt to provide equal time um, for the good efforts that people make. Um, and so we received a thank you letter in the mail. And I'll, it, it's as follows. Dear Douglas County Department of Corrections, my parents, who are 75 years old, had their first interactions with your department on Monday, February 11, 2019, when they posted bail for a family friend. I just wanted to tell you thank you for being so nice to them and explaining the process of it all. Also, thank you for helping their friend make it to their car okay. It's a process they hope to never have to do again as it was stressful for them. You all made it bearable and treated them with respect, which I really appreciate. And I won't read the person's name who sent it for their privacy, but, um, but I see the, get to see those acts of kindness and compassion on a regular basis, and I want to make sure that I note them uh, when they occur. The commissioners are also aware of a, an incident that we had just this past weekend uh, some very heroic actions, which I will expound upon more at a future meeting. But very good stuff. With that, any questions? Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Uh, yes, I uh, want to commend your staff for the uh, prompt uh, action professionalism and the uh, incident you referenced. Uh, please pass along our commendation to them. Um, just a, a few quick questions. Mm -hmm. The personnel section um, that you address, I think that's section four. Um, I'm just trying to get kind of some specificity on where we have just been because we've got a, a complete 2018 year where there was a lot of activity in personnel. Mm -hmm. So to kind of quantify, you know, this ongoing understaffing situation that we have that's chronic and that you rightly indicate is a problem. Um, in 2018, we had a definite number of mandatory overtime hours. Are you aware of what that number is? Um, I, I am, I would hate to off the top of my head give you the number. It's, it sure. was a big number. Right. Um, hundred. I'm going to hold off on okay. guessing. Okay. Because I've heard this is just anecdotally, and, and please forward us that I information. Will. Yes. It's it's in the tens of thousands the, of hours. At least that, sir. Right. Um, and I don't know if that would help us in our deliberations to have some of that laid out in uh, the personnel thing, but. It would help me, and I'm going to keep asking if, if it's not there, you know, because the, the numbers are as specific as the numbers that we have on our population, and as I presume as easily uh, available. So if you, could, if you could get that overtime number for 2018, I'd appreciate it. Then the same uh, is true of our personnel question. So you have an authorized uh, complement of how many people? I, I'm not asking you, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Sure. If you don't have it, you know, please send it to me. Okay. And then you're currently at another number. I, I presume it's not we, exactly the same. We number. are, um, I can tell you we are 30 officer, with this new hire off class that just started yesterday. Right. Uh, we are 30 officers short. Okay. Um, just so we can get some idea in terms of the annual play out of this, we, and we've talked about this before, we hired X number of officers in 2018, and Y number of officers left our employment in 2018. So 
you know, you take the one number and you subtract the other number. I, it would be helpful if we had those numbers. Absolutely. And I, um, I can tell you those are numbers that are ingrained in my memory pretty because oh, okay. that's been a big focus. We, we hired 104 officers in 2018. Okay. Um, there were 89 all told, including retirements and career changes and, and so forth. Um, that uh, that left employment, so we had a net gain of 15. Okay. Um, the the troubling stat within that is that we had 47 officers who left in 2018 who worked for us less than a year, and that's the that's the focus of trying to improve that outcome. So that 104 figure would be the the pool from which about 47 left. Correct. And there may be some. There may not be the exact same because you'll have carryover from the previous year, but yeah. Pretty big Roughly. overlap, okay. And uh, do you have an authorized strength number that you could share with us? Um, I can't quote that for you. I believe it's around 370. Okay. But I can I can get that specifically for you. Right. Um, kudos on this mentoring class. I think that'll help a lot. I mean, retention is the name of the game here. I mean, we're hiring substantially the number that we should hire. We're just not retaining Correct. anywhere close to the number that we should retain. So I, I think that that's a, a great step and I want to congratulate you on um, the um, impact of that on our retention should be fairly, you know, if we're looking at this a year from now, we should be able to see that. Right. So this population number of uh, average of 1267 mm -hmm. is still extremely high. Um, and, and seems to be remain, remaining at that. So we're dealing with high population and high turnover. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the crux of the problem. That continues to be a critical problem right. in corrections. Okay. That's correct, sir. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle. I had to look at uh, Commissioner LaFong to make sure I have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I want to add a, a two cents to the uh, overtime uh, discussion, and it's one that's, uh, well, I suppose, a little delicate, but the union, this is something beyond what, uh, Commissioner Cavanaugh, this is something beyond what our director can, ha can control. Uh, the union contract calls for who gets to work overtime, and many times, most of the time, not many times, all the time, it's an officer uh, of high rank. And so the pay is, the rate of pay is exacerbated by that person's rate and then plus. And embarrassingly, the last time I looked at the top 10 salaries uh, in Douglas County, three of them were correction officers. And they're pretty substantial. I'm not saying they're not, they're doing their job, no doubt about it. But it is, um, if you quote somebody in Washington, it's kind of rigged so that, um, the, the pay is uh, is pretty high, and it's it's something that uh, I don't think the union is too interested in changing. So I mentioned that. Um, one of the things that um, I have been concerned about is that I've asked uh, in our facilities that have uh, people who are uh, in trouble, one way or the other, whether it's a psychiatric unit or whether it's the correction <laughs> unit. Uh, I like to publicize, um, not a lot of information, but at least that the incidents occur because uh, I always read about or hear about what happens in uh, Tecumseh and all these places in which they have a lot, a lot of trouble. But we never hear about, I don't think we hear about, except through phone calls, about some somebody who's been bitten or some other thing has occurred. And I think to respect the danger of their job and to re give them some respect that we're aware of what's happening, um, I think we need to do that much more than we do. In fact, I don't think we really do it at all. So I would like, I don't know if we can add that legally. We got to do something to, without names, of course. And then the incident that occurred over the weekend is, uh, uh, that's one that really uh, deserves a great deal of um, attention because uh, officers stepped in and saved uh, an inmate's life. And, um, you know, we have trouble over there where sometimes people die in our facility and no fault of ours, but that happens. And so then we have this heroic effort uh, that was remarkable. I don't know if I, I don't know how I would have done that, and I'm not sure, you know, if I would have come up with a tourniquet like they did. Pretty, pretty classy. They're remarkable, and I really hope that we can parade them up here and tell them so, and I know that's what, maybe what you're thinking. Uh, I want to mention something kind of strange that I read the other day about um, 
a discovery, and I think it's Johnson & Johnson that's uh, selling it, but they have discovered, a, uh, and it, it is in use now, uh, a nasal spray to uh, combat depression. And um, there was a fellow that had used it three times and nothing happened, and the fourth time he said it was like the whole world opened up to him. Uh, and I, I'd like to, us to explore that to just see if it's, I don't know what it costs or what it is, but it may set some people on some real, real good paths. I think we ought to explore that in the psych unit and also in corrections if we can. I'm not sure who would do that, but uh, I'd like to have that done if we can. Um, I also attended, and it was really, I shouldn't say this, it was a little bit, everything was going along fine at, in Washington at this seminar on uh, bail until the uh, attorney spoke. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. Anyway, it was really impossible to follow. And, um, you know, he had his own method of uh, graph that had arrows and things pointing all, everywhere, you know. And when I picked up, I picked up his handout and it was so worthless, I'm sorry to say, I left it. I should have brought it so I could just show you, you'd knock you out. There wasn't a bit of white space on it, and it was just like, it was about four sheets on both sides, you know. Anyway, it was about bail. And um, uh, I asked the question, I did ask the question there, I said, how do you, how do you protect a judge who um, gives bail to someone who's uh, maybe a little iffy? How do you, and we've had those instances. And I brought it up where we had um, some, a lot of things fell apart. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but there were a lot of things that came apart when that bail was set. And the judge did what is normal under the conditions, but knowing what he knew is, was right, it was correct. But he really got whacked because the person had killed someone in a car accident, had been drinking, and he was an undocumented person who obviously didn't stick around for his, paid the bail and got the hell out of here, which is what you'd expect him to do. So I'm trying to figure out a way, uh, one of the things I suggested was what, about, what if, what if, uh, and I've said this before, that the judge would sentence a person to the correction facility. And the correction facility has staff and they have the knowledge. They work with these people. They know, they know them inside and out. They're used to them. They are in a great position to decide what they need. Now, I, I'd like to see us try that. And I frankly would like to see like a five person panel. The reason is that uh, if someone pulls a Dukakis, which I've referenced in Washington, if someone pulls a Dukakis and a guy goes out and rapes and pillages, that we don't have one person, the judge, to point to because that chills the judge from doing these things that are in the public interest. If we did it to the facility, the facility bears the burden and you've got five people making a decision, I think it'd be terrific, but I'd like to pursue that sometime if it could be done. Um, finally, um, on the GED, one of the things that, um, one of the things I did that was kind of fun, I brought business cards and I gave each one of the GED graduates my card I said, you're going to need a reference, and it can't be your mom or dad or your uncle, so put me down for a reference, so we'll see what happens. The other thing, I, there's some other needs that I think they have, and I, I don't know if it's housing, possibly, transportation, or if there's some other things, and I'd like to explore that, if you would. Be sure we're giving them a package when they leave here that is also very practical, uh, and I'm not sure what they are. Uh, maybe they're all set, but some, I have a feeling, are not living at home. Uh, what do they need? And let's get them... I'd like to see giving them some help like that so they're not on their own. And also, Metro Community College has some terrific programs that I think they could slide right into, to tell you the truth. I'm doing too much talking here. Um, I guess that's, um, that's really what I wanted to bring up. And I, I, I'm really happy with the work that you're doing and uh, with Amber. I think that's uh, you're a great combo and uh, you had a great dimension. I have heard from the union about you and uh, they like what you're doing. They like accessibility. They like being included. Uh, it, and I think it makes a difference. I hope it will, although they've been very cooperative in the past. But I think you're on the definitely on the right track. So thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. And I, I obviously am one person, and this is a very large operation. And I, I get to stand out front here, but my role is actually very small in the grand scheme of right. things. So I need everybody's input and everybody's uh, participation to make it successful. I expect you to say that. Thanks. Commissioner Kraft. Yes. Um, I'm interested in the yoga. Was there good participation, good acceptance? Yeah, so we did a, um, a pilot last year where we offered it um, to veterans, um, part of treatment, for, um, thinking about PTSD and the trauma and so forth that uh, as, as a potential uh, intervention for some of those symptoms that they have. Um, it is just started, um, and 
it appears to be being very well received. I can probably give you more um, information in a month um, as to how it's going um, and, and more specific feedback. Um, Justine Wall, who, um, who is in charge of getting that up and running, I'll have her come to the next board meeting and provide you an update. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Commissioner Morgan. Well, I talked to you yesterday and thanked you. You know, Mark Foxhall did an excellent job, and you've followed up with excellent communications with all of us and the job you're doing, Amber, your team. Uh, so I'm appreciative of that. Uh, at the same time on that retention matter, I mean, we've talked about the difficulty and what a challenging job this really is there, and we've seen it firsthand when people are being checked in when we've been there. And Mike, you've worked closely, very closely with corrections, and I, and I know you do your best on the retention. I mean, it's a much, much different uh, vocation, and your people are so, uh, uh, I think they put forth the greatest uh, effort in respect for the people that are there, and we've talked about that. So, I mean, it's just something that's not going to go away. It, it's a tough job. Uh, so I thank you for what you try to do, and as you know, all of us on this board are always willing to listen to anything you have to tell as us as suggestions because we want to be as supportive as we can possibly be. But you are in one of the areas of the most challenging uh, uh, jobs, you and your people. So I thank you for the respect you constantly show to the people that unfortunately have to be there in difficult circumstances. So thanks again. Thank you. And I wanted to say, um, you know, Commissioner Boyle uh, mentioned about hearing about incidents that occur in other facilities um, and they get publicized. You know, oftentimes we have those things that happen regularly. Um, oftentimes it's involving our, our mentally ill population. Um, and for the, our staff oftentimes do not want to press charges, even if they've been assaulted, if they've been bitten, if they've been hit. Um, because they know that that behavior is a manifestation of their illness um, and, and not a, just an independent act of aggression on that person's part. Um, so that, that keeps it out of the news because there aren't charges that are filed because our, our staff, um, you know, sometimes it crosses the line and, and you do have to press charges and people have to be held accountable, but oftentimes uh, they don't because they realize who they're dealing with and why this behavior occurred. So just another credit to our staff. Commissioner Moore. Just to follow up on that, I, uh, and I understand that fully, it, it bothers me a great deal that someone who's suffering from mental illness uh, and there's, you know, you see that signs in medical facilities, you know, attacking a medical personnel is a felony, you know. Well, someone who's having difficulty and then attacks someone to slap them with a felony it really just sends them right down the tubes. I mean, that's just the end of it. So I do appreciate very much what you're saying, and I knew that was happening. What I am interested in, though, is even though we, when we don't press charges, uh, that the injuries are, you know, we're aware that someone got slugged, Absolutely. someone lost a tooth, whatever it is that we, you know, that is publicized there was an attack somewhere. Maybe I'm over-dramatizing this, but we'll see if it works. Maybe it won't. Um, and the last thing I wanted to ask you is we, I talked to Commissioner Rogers about a tour of the facility, and um, uh, he's going to make we the talk. decision uh, when we do it. And, uh, um, yeah, we talk, he, he's saying we probably, April, he's got a, 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 a cell that should be close to done, in between done, so he can, we can see one that's done with people in it and one close to being done. So he, he said he'll give us a, a time in April. Which commissioner are we going to lock up? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't ask, Mike. <laughs> Ms. LaFong. Mike, you're doing a great Commissioner job. Commissioner Borgs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so congratulations again to Amber and now to Debbie. You've added two great uh, women to your team, and I'm excited to see that actually there's women on your team. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about the, um, on a positive, 
active budgetary note mm -hmm. um, and our revenue is tracking ahead, does that include the revenue that the city owes us that we've been behind on? <laughs> it does. So yeah. we are up to date or are we still? Um, I know that there's been some payments that were made recently. I can't tell you exactly where that stands to the, to okay, the percentage I'll check with that they're Joe behind, after but this um, it is an ongoing issue. The issue is not yet completely resolved, but there has been some progress. progress. Okay. okay. All right. I'll ch talk with Joe about that. And then the discharge planning, to Commissioner Boyle's point, um, when we talked about the GED graduates and them um, leaving our facility, um, the social workers actually do discharge planning with each individual actually starting upon booking to make sure that they are ready and have what they need to have when they leave, correct? That's correct. Okay, so, and now it's even more intense because they're up in the mods with them mm -hmm. to kind of do it on a regular basis. Yep. Um, and so, again, that discharge planning, to your point, is so important that we are make sure that we're, yeah, that it's going on and we're leaving them with the tools and resources that they need so they don't come back. Good. Um, Thanks. Uh-huh. And then the, um, on the mental health issue, um, uh, how many do we currently have today waiting to go to the regional center? Um, I had an email last week, and uh, if memory serves, there's somewhere around 10 or 11 people on the list. On the waiting list? For LRC. 10 or 11. Because I know we have about four in acute hospitals, but I don't know. I didn't know the number for court orders and those right. waiting. Okay. All right. It might be helpful if we coordinate with Brent from the region to mm -hmm. include that in our ongoing report so everybody's up to speed with what those numbers are yep I mean I we're constantly working banging on the door um, in trying to get that process moved along but I think the more we talk about it and the more we put it out there that it would be a good thing to have especially during this report and it, it's typically it, it's, a, it's at least a 90-day wait, wait. Mm -hmm. and that's after a fairly lengthy process to get to that point right. um, to be to even be put on the list right okay well let's maybe talk a little bit further about what Absolutely. we should include and talk to um, Patty and Brent about what to include in the report Certainly. thank you great you're doing a good job thank you okay all right thank you, thank you. appreciate thank you. it then most to adjourn so moved motion by Commissioner Cora second by Commissioner Boyle please vote Motion passes seven to zero. We'll now call the Board of Commissioners meeting order. Roll call, please. Commissioner Borgeson? Here. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Here. Commissioner Duda? Here. Commissioner Kraft? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. Item one is minutes and claims. Letter A is approval of the minutes of the Board of Commissioners meeting held Tuesday, February 26, 2019. Uh, item B is approval of the claims submitted for payment and process through Tuesday, March 12th, 2019. What's the will of the Board? Motion to approve A and B by Commissioner Kraft, second by Commissioner Boyle, Commissioner Cavanaugh. I have a question on one of our um, checks, uh, 519520, 519-520, uh, which is a check for $100,000 to the Metropolitan Utilities District regarding acquisition costs um, from the capital improvement budget. We passed a resolution I, I believe unanimously on December 18th, uh, directing the county attorney and public properties to negotiate an agreement with MUD for the purchase of that block. Uh, but since then, I think that the building commission has stepped in as the actual purchaser uh, in place of Douglas County. And so I guess my question would be the $100,000 check that Douglas County is writing to MUD for acquisition. Um, how does that play into the purchase, which is now not Douglas County's purchase, but um, I believe the Building Commission's purchase? Yep. County Attorney, maybe. Yeah, Teresa York County Attorney's Office. So, um, if I may, I'll try to provide a little bit of clarity. 
Douglas County is purchasing that uh, block from MUD. And then through a separate purchase agreement, the Public Building Commission will be purchasing that same block from Douglas County. And so I, I believe that $100,000 is the earnest deposit between Douglas County and MUD. Uh, that purchase agreement is in place with MUD and the due diligence going forward towards closing has already begun. Okay, so <clears throat> the purchase price I think that we agreed on in our initial resolution was a $6 million purchase price, is that correct? Tracy York Douglas County, that is correct, plus closing costs, which I don't have a specific figure for those at this time, Commissioner. But yes, $6 million purchase price plus closing. Okay. And then um, most recently, the Building Commission passed a resolution for, I believe, $6.25 million. Oh, six, two. Six, $6 million, uh, to, to uh, reimburse Douglas County for these costs. Is that right? I, I believe the clarification provided by Commissioner Duda just now was that it's not to exceed or up to that amount, yes. Okay. So at the end of the day, Douglas County will own the block or the Building Commission will own the block? At the end of the day, uh, the Public Building Commission will, will own the block. So. Douglas County is still currently negotiating the purchase agreement with MUD, is that correct? We have reached a final on that, and I believe it will be up for consideration before the PBC this Thursday, two days from now. Okay, I guess my question was, Douglas County has concluded a purchase agreement with MUD, or? Uh, I apologize, I thought you said PBC. So we do have a purchase agreement finalized with MUD, and we've begun the inspection and surveying and things of that nature uh, going towards closing. Okay. So will that agreement come before the board? No. On December 18th, the resolution that this board passed, it authorized the chair and vice and or vice chair to sign the purchase agreement with MUD, and Chair Rogers did sign that agreement. Okay. And do we know when that was concluded? I don't want to misspeak. Uh, I can say that MUD and Douglas County, I recall we signed on different days, but it has been fully executed. So then uh, at the building commission meeting Thursday of this week? Yes. They will uh, do what? What action? I believe that on Thursday, I have not seen their agenda, but I believe that I anticipate that they will take up a purchase agreement between Douglas County and the PBC with that closing set a little bit later than the closing between MUD and Douglas County. Okay. Will that agreement then come back before the board? No. This board, when it passed the resolution authorizing the 16th Amendment to the series of bonds that we have with the Public Building Commission, when this board authorized the 16th Amendment, that resolution also authorized the chair or vice chair to execute any and all and I'm paraphrasing, any and all documents necessary to help MUD acquire, uh, to, excuse me, to help PBC acquire a site. So I don't anticipate that that will come back. Great. But the, the net effect is going to be that Douglas County will be held harmless, will be compensated entirely for our... our, our, our the, the draft of the purchase agreement that I anticipate PBC will take up on Thursday, the purchase price is $6 million plus our closing costs, that we expended doing the MUD purchase. So it should get us back to zero. Thank you. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There is a motion to second. Please vote. Oh, I'll be it. I'm sorry, I have one other. Okay. Person. Uh, this is on a, uh, a different uh, item, J. Um, that's the acceptance of an updated memorandum of understanding between Douglas County Juvenile Assessment We're Center. We're not there yet. Sorry? Not there yet. Oh, You're I still in on the consent agenda. No. Oh. We're not on the consent agenda? No, we still got to approve A and B. Uh, I'm going to be abstaining. Moore. It's a building we manage. Oh, Madison Clay, sorry. I'm be abstaining as a building we manage. There's checks in there for me, so I wanted to make that clear. There is a motion to second for A and B. Please vote.
Motion passes. Uh, Commissioner Morgan abstaining. Other commissioners voting yes. Item two is the consent agenda. We have 10 items. Uh, what's the will of the board? Is there a motion? Motion approved. Motion by Commissioner Boyle, second by Commissioner Duda. Uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Now, on, um, I, I, I have a couple. Just item J, which is the acceptance of a memorandum of understanding between Douglas County Juvenile Assessment Center and the Sherwood Foundation for the pr pr purpose of providing an evaluation of the Juvenile Assessment Center. Um, and I don't know if there's anybody from juvenile assessment here, but if, if there is someone who could address this, a couple of questions. What is the commitment of Douglas County to the Sherwood Foundation relative to the acceptance of these um, funds, I presume, and then what's the dollar amount of the funds, if anybody knows? Patrick Bloomingdale County Administrator, Sean Kuhnfair had to take today and uh, tomorrow off for personal reasons, otherwise she would be here. This is a continuation of the um, analysis that Category 1 Consulting has been doing with a committee formed of um, internal stakeholders to review, analyze the operations of the JAC. This is a continuation of that. There's no money expended by the county. Sherwood's fully funding the assessment by category one they're basically category one is basically acting as facilitators for this group that's been meeting on a I think monthly basis to spend a couple of hours talking about what the jack does um, how has it been effective how can it you know, what should it be doing better what other things should it be doing so it's just a kind of like a strategic assessment and planning process this is just a continuation of that and how long has this been going on? Several months. Um, is there, a, at the end of the, the period of review, um, a report that's going to be presented to the, to the board? Yes, and there was a report presented uh, on the first phase. It was just recently presented to the board by Category 1 Consulting. Um, this is the second phase. There will be another report presented to the board by Category 1 at the end of, the, of this phase. Do we know when that is? I, I don't know that at the time. That's on the Child, Child New Services Committee for next Tuesday to be presented about what this stage will be. Okay. Um, one other question on another item, uh, which is the um, C, adoption of the scale rates of the Pheasant Point landfill, which has been before us be before, and I, I noticed that um, Ken Holm is here today from Environmental Services. And if you could just briefly um, give us a, a, a quick overview. This is a pretty important operation of the counties, and I know that waste management has been involved with this as well, and they're here today. Um, okay, Ken, hold on. For the record, since this is being talked about separately, Ken, I'm going to put you in the rule. So you got five minutes. We'll go through the pros and that, and then you'll go from there. So you're on the clock. All right, no pressure. <laughs> All right, uh, Kent Holm, Environmental Services Director. Um, I have all the slides that I showed you two weeks ago. Uh, happy to address any particular things that, that you'd like to see. Um, I'm going to skip forward to what is being proposed. And uh, basically, we're taking the, the, the per ton over the scale rate that exists right now. We're going to break that into three components. Um, the rate's going to be the same up until uh, December 1st of this year, where there will be a CPI uh, adjustment uh, added to those. Uh, we are adding two new rates. One is a transfer station, a tr transfer station trailer MSW. MSW stands for Municipal Solid Waste, and a transfer station trailer C and D Salvage Site Waste. C and D is construction demolition debris. So the, be the benefits of those that, that changing, <coughs> uh, changing rate structure, we're going to get upgraded reporting. It'll allow us to, to look at the different waste streams a little more specifically and to, to chart trends and so on. Uh, very importantly, uh, it will help put us on a more level playing field with other, other regional landfills. 
and from a, a county impact, uh, we're going to see some additional uh, revenue coming in. These are transfer trailer rates that will capture new waste streams coming in. So these are the are the proposed rates. 2592 is the scale rate right now. Again, we're breaking that down into three components, so that that rate will stay the same until December 1st of 2019. And then these are the two transfer sta station. Uh, rates uh, for the MSW municipal solid waste and C&D construction demolition debris and those rates will stay constant through November 30th 2019 once we get to to the, well this October I'll bring a resolution in front of you uh, it will do a CPI uh, consumer price index adjustment and one of the things that will also happen here in, in 2019 is for two of those uh, initial rates, we're going to do a CPI adjustment plus add 20 cents to those. Uh, there will be no change to those particular um, transfer trailer rates for the first year. And then the following year, uh, we're going to do uh, another adjustment right there. Uh, basically adding another 20 cents to those two particular uh, uh, commercial collection vehicle rates. Uh, the transfer station rates would then be subject to the CPI, but that wouldn't happen until October 20, 2020 and would go into effect on December 1st of 2020. And then the next year, it's just the CPI adjustment that would be done. So that, very briefly, shows what, what, we're, what we're proposing. Again, uh, the, the benefits to the county, uh, we, get, we get some good reporting upgrades. Uh, it, it helps to level the playing field with competition uh, from other landfills, and uh, the, the revenue impact should be positive there for the county as well. Just one question. Uh, the 100000 that you put there as a county impact uh, for the first two or three years, is that 100000 per year? Or? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. See no question. There's a motion to second. Please vote. Chair. Oh, Mr. Moore. I have a question about Jay. Jay. Please. Just briefly. I, I, I'm really uh, pleased about this uh, uh, group assessing uh, the organization, looking to see what they're doing and how they're performing. And I, I think we have two other, I always call them the alphabet agencies, but we have a couple other alphabet agencies that are uh, in that, the home program and so forth. I would like to see that as well. I mentioned this to Commissioner Rogers and uh, Commissioner Borgeson, that's one of the things I'm real concerned about, that those agencies, those alphabet agencies, be up to speed and be producing uh, so that we don't have any gaps in, in uh, coverage uh, and, and in, in our mission. So I'd like to ask if it's possible that we could do the same thing with uh, anyone else who is uh, uh, in a position of uh, diverting uh, young people from the youth center. So I, I appreciate just want to make that comment. and. Uh, if anybody wants to make a commitment, I'm ready for it. I'm just kidding. But I, I hope we can do that. Thank you. And I think a little bit of the commitment for some of them was yesterday from the presentation that we had with, with Promise. So that's that started. I'm sorry. I said the commitment with some of the others will come through the uh, presentation we had yesterday oh. here with Promise. Okay, good deal. Uh, there's a motion to second. Please vote. Motion passes seven to zero. Sorry, Commissioner Dew. As they're walking away, I just want to thank Kent Holman Waste Management. A couple of months ago, uh, John Christensen of Abe's Trash, who I know a little bit, uh, called me with what I thought was a legitimate problem. Uh, I passed this along to Kent Holm and Waste Management, and this is we got what I think is a great solution in response. Uh, they addressed what I thought, I mean, John Christensen said, boy, do I have to come down to the county board meeting again? It's before my time, the last time he was here. But he's come down ranting and raving before and was threatening to do that again. I said, we've got good staff. You aren't going to have to rant and rave. I think we can address your problems in, a, in an orderly fashion, and I want to thank our staff and waste management for doing so. Thank you. We'll move on to recognition and proclamations. Item A is a resolution honoring the career of Sue Mahaffey, a longtime uh, educator and, and ambassador to the Douglas County and the Omaha Sister City Association. I'll, I'll read this and ask for action and turn over to Commissioner Kraft. Whereas Ms. Sue Mahaffey 
was an Omaha native and graduate of Omaha Benson High School, and whereas Ms. Maffey was a dedicated physical education teacher, coach, and supervisor of physical education for more than 30 years in the Omaha Public Schools before retiring, and whereas Ms. Maffey, who was often described as the Energizer Bunny, spent nearly 20 years committed to the Omaha Sister Cities Association as a board member and coordinating council director, and whereas Ms. Maffey, was an incredible advocate for an, an ambassador for Douglas County and Omaha, having promoted opportunities and economic possibilities in our community to international students and professionals through the Omaha Sister Cities, and whereas Ms. Maffey visited all of the Omaha Sister Cities in Japan, Germany, Lithuania, Ireland, Mexico, and China several times, and even hosted international visitors to our community regularly, and which, whereas Ms. Maffey constantly amazed people with her love of life and laughter, her contagious enthusiasm and complete acceptance for everyone. And whereas Ms. Maffey was a leader and a diplomat who volunteered countless hours of her time uh, for the benefit of enhancing our community's global awareness. And whereas Ms. Maffey passed away on March 8, 2019 and will be sorely missed. Now therefore be resolved by the Board of County Commissioners of Douglas County, Nebraska that this board hereby honors the life of Ms. Sue Maffey for her many contributions to the promotion of the du of Douglas County, Omaha, and the entire community. With that, I ask for a motion and a second. I so moved. Motion by Commissioner Kraft, second by Commissioner Duda. Commissioner Kraft. Yes. So, <coughs> excuse my voice, it goes in and out. <coughs> That's not all bad. You're going to get the worst of it. Okay. So, uh, Sue is going to be laid to rest tomorrow at uh, 11 a.m. Oh, um, um, she was so energetic and so responsible for, yes, so for making so much of the communications happen between us and the city of Omaha and our six sister cities. Uh, in lieu of flowers, they asked not to send flowers, but to send donations to the UNO Omaha Women's Athletics or to the Henry Dorley Zoo. And <clears throat> Sue asked one thing for those who attend her funeral. If you attend it, please feel free to wear comfortable clothing and wear color. She liked color. She did not want everyone in black, and she lived a life full of color. Uh, some of the things people say about her are just absolutely fantastic. I knew she was loved, but I didn't know how well loved she was. Uh, <clears throat> one person on face on uh, on the Sister City site. For those who don't know what Sister Cities is, it's a relationship where we exchange cultures between the Omaha culture and the culture of our Sister City in Suzuka, Japan. Uh, Chalet, Lithuania, um, Yantai, China, <coughs> uh, Braunschweig, Germany, Nace, Ireland, and Jalapa, uh, Mexico. We bring art in for their, from their countries and they exhibit it many times at Joslin. We were the first time that uh, Riviera, um, oh shoot, uh, was allowed to exhibit outside the United States by the Mexican government. It was a fantastic exhibit that they sent to us. Uh, they sent a replica of one of the Incan heads, which is down at the zoo. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the uh, LB-262, which is visitor money, um, helped fund the Japanese garden. And a good portion of that was built by Japanese artists who came through and hand-built using ancient tools, the tea chapel and the gate. Uh, it's just, just amazing what we've done with these relationships. Professors, students, scouting, um, uh, UNO, Creighton University, uh, Sue coordinated all of this. <coughs> uh, uh, I'd like to read just a paragraph here. Sue Mahaffey wore many hats. But the, uh, it, one of those was a Sister City hat with all the flags of the Sister Cities in it. Very colorful. By the way, I'm wearing a brown shrug Germany tie today. In honor of Sue, it's colorful and it represents Sister Cities. 
Uh, <clears throat> it spoke volumes about who she was, fun, all-inclusive, bright, and a citizen of the world. She was a teacher and a leader. She taught by example and led with joy. She had a uni unique way of bringing out the best in those around her by cheering their efforts and by lifting them up. On the side, I never heard her speak ill of anyone. I never heard her say a foul word or absolutely nothing derogatory. Everything was positive. Okay. Um, she, could, she could and would walk and talk. She could and would talk to anyone she met, even if there was a language difference. Her warmth made people feel comfortable around her and generated friendship all around the world. Uh, she got involved in sister cities by going as an exchange teacher to Suzuka, Japan, and she was hooked. Um, so uh, there's just a tremendous amount of loss for the sister city organization. And, and um, hopefully we can find somebody who's got the unbridled energy that she had um, to continue on. Thank you. Commissioner Morgan. I wanted to thank you, uh, Mark, for your comments about her, and also mention that uh, she is at, real active also with the League of Women Voters, mm -hmm. and they put out an email, uh, you know, about the loss. So, thank you. Uh, really, a good person. If I may, that I didn't know. Uh, I and and I've been Richard Ketchy got me hooked. He told me I had to be at a meeting at seven thirty. One morning after I was sworn in for the city council, but before we had our first meeting, and he made sure I attended, and um, I got hooked. So it's a great organization. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's a motion to second. Please vote. Motion passes seven to zero. Item B is a recognition of the following county employees retired. Ms. Stan Mr. Stanley Cruz has retired from the Douglas County Sheriff's Department after 10 years of service. Uh, with the, and we'd like to thank him for his years of service. With that, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the resolution. Motion by Commissioner Boyle, second by Commissioner Duda. Please vote. Motion passes seven to zero. Item four, citizens' comments. This is an opportunity for citizens to comment on county board related items that are not officially listed on the agenda. Are there any citizens' comments? <clears throat> Larry Store, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha 68132. First, I'd like to mention that this week is Mental Awareness Week, Brain Awareness Week, I to be more specific. So I'd like, I believe I sent you all an email about it. Uh, there's an organization called the National Organization for Disorders of the Corpus Callosum. For those of you that don't know, that's the center line between the two hemispheres of the brain by which your neurons cross and communicate with the body. Well, these people uh, are a pretty good organization of patients, parents, professionals, educators, scientists that have studied disorders involving the brain for many, many years, going back before 2008 when I got involved. Uh, in fact, they were doing some of the research that people are trying to do in Omaha now with the new machines, uh, duplicating things that have been done before. But anyway, please look that up, nodcc.org and encourage your people that are stakeholders in the various juvenile programs that we have going, studying behavior, to look into the disorders of the brains as being maybe causes of this disorders and behaviors by which they get suspended, locked up in jail, assessed, et cetera. Uh, there's usually a cause to behavior, is what most people say. There's usually a cause to delinquency. We can all disagree with what that is. Uh, I would also like to 
have somebody clarify the rules. As I understand, I cannot comment on item J of the consent agenda or on child and youth services because they're on the agenda. Is that correct? That's wrong. No, you, you could have commented on the consent agenda item. I'm sorry? You could have commented on the consent agenda item. Uh, it was an action item. You could have commented on that. If there's the only thing that can't be commented on is if you make a comment during this period, the board can't openly discuss it because it's not listed on the agenda item. The topic is not there. So any citizen is open to comment on any item that's on the agenda as an action item. Uh, well, you need to change some words there. Cause I'm not supposed to be going now. I'm just clarifying you. Let's don't argue about it, but please change it. The other thing I want to quick, quickly mention is uh, I understand that Douglas County is somewhat affiliated with the Durham Museum. And this last week has been uh, citizenship week for a lot of things, too. I did go down and see the citizenship uh, uh, display. Uh, American doc democracy. Uh, but I want to read something from one of their handouts. This involves education, stakeholders, citizens, students, and teachers. I also attended a teacher workshop. What I don't like about this was the end part of the exhibit is all about uh, mass demonstrations and voting and voters' rights, not so much about the structure of the, the government being a republic rather than a democracy. To give you an example of why it's not per, per se accurate, <clears throat> they quote here, fulfilling the ideals of American democracy required defining the people and determining the meaning of citizenship, not clearly articulated in the Founding Fathers' documents. Clarify, not clearly articulated. <clears throat> These unsettled issues were left for future generations. Catch that. It means next generation means something different to the Founding Fathers than my generation does. Some basic questions have long been debated by Americans. How diverse should the citizenship be, the citizenry? Do we need to share a common national story? Do we need to even argue that? What are the rights and responsibilities of citizens? Don't we already know that? Don't we already swear to that? My point being, the progressives have changed our Constitution from a pocket edition to over 3,000 pages because of things like this. Founding Fathers didn't care about social justice. They cared about a new nation. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All righty, we'll move on to uh, committee's item of discussion. Item A is the finance report. Uh, item one is the budget report. Commissioners Morgan and Boyle. As presented, right. my uh, the only thing I'd like to add is that I've asked uh, Joe Lorenz to uh, notify all uh, department heads and elected officials that uh, I'd like to see what their construction plans are for offices and other facilities because sometimes uh, there's some. Uh, quite a few things going on that we don't know about that are come from some source wherever it is so I'd like to see that just just know just some more information thank you item G is the human resource report item one is the weekly personnel report from civil service as submitted um, there are no stated items on the legislative issues is there anything wanting someone like to <laughs> Commissioner uh, thank you mr. chair um, I have been asked and I don't know for sure why we haven't had this on the agenda, but um, LB 309, which is increasing the number of district court judges in Douglas County, is basically um, on its uh, sailing through the legislature um, without any comment from us, and we, I'm being asked what's our position on it. And, um, of course, I say that it's an unfunded mandate. Um, and I'm not here to argue the necessity of it, but I'm here to argue the unfunded mandate um, piece of it. Uh, Senator Legrone has an amendment, which I'm trying to find out if it's still up for consideration, where there is a piece, um, the amendment calls for the state to reimburse the county uh, for the cost of that judge, um, which includes those unfunded mandates we have of space, 
um, general support, um, um, uh, the bailiffs, whatever other costs we have as counties when it comes to adding a judge to um, whatever court it is here in Douglas County. Um, with the space considerations that we have currently, um, I think it would be prudent for us to say one of two things. One, while we, the necessity again, I'm not arguing, but we need to wait until we have the proper space. Let us get the courthouse expansion done and we can then talk about adding more. Um, so at that juncture, um, I think we, we should oppose LB 309 as it sits today. Um, the other is to um, support it with the amendment that the state reimburse us for um, our cost in adding this judge, which does not take away from the issue of where are we going to put this judge. And the reason I say that is because there have been bills and one that just passed um, regarding property tax. And the state is the first to pass all of these conditions onto local government about what they can and can't do. They cap us, say we have to do this, we have to do that. Um, but yet here we have bills that are basically pay passing onto uh, local government um, and local taxpayers an unfunded mandate and we just sit idly by letting it sail through and we can't do that. Um, I respect the senator who is proposing this and that's Senator Lathrop. He's a good friend. I've known him for years. He's a great public servant. Um, but we have to take a position. They're asking us, where are we on this? And at this juncture, with the space needs, with the unfunded mandates, with the now things they're doing to us on the property tax piece of things, we have to say no, unless it's that amendment is attached and the state wants to pay for all of the cost and take us off the hook for it, our local taxpayers off the hook for it. And so um, I think we need to have a discussion about this and decide what we want to do. Um, and I know it's going to be up for hearing today at 11 o'clock, and we need to let our senators know where we are on this issue. Thank you. I appreciate your bringing that one up, uh, Commissioner Bergeson. This is very important. Uh, the one question that nobody's ever answered is where are we going to put the courtroom? If we get this 17th District Court judge, we don't have room for a courtroom. We can figure out where to make judges' chambers on the wrong floor. Uh, and that's it. We do not have the space for another courtroom over there. I think that asking them to hold off on giving us another judge until we have our courthouse addition built would be appropriate. As I recall, the fiscal note on this one was about two and a quarter million the first year and about one and a quarter million every year thereafter. Uh, on an ongoing basis, the, the, the original extra million dollars for building the, the, the courtroom, basically. Uh, I would be all for asking them to, to hold off on this. I mean, we aren't making much progress uh, at the moment on expanding the courthouse. And if we keep dragging our feet on this forever, uh, I don't know where we will ever put any more uh, courtrooms. So I think I would support if, if I mean I'd be happy to make a motion that that our stand on 309 be that uh, we would ask them to hold off on giving us giving us any more district court judges until we can expand our courthouse and have room for them we have okay. nowhere to put them can you tell me how Senator Lathrop voted on LB I believe it was LB 103 the one that affects our ability to raise our taxes. I think it went through, and Marcos can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was a 40, it, maybe not 49, but 48, 47, 47 to nothing. 47 In our own yeah. state, yeah. in our own state, let our own local representatives obviously voted for it in right. most cases, if not all. Right. Well, uh, Commissioner Crapper, you can make a point. I think it. If you want to clarify, 103 doesn't okay. inhibit us from doing it. It says you got to put a separate item on. Yeah. Uh, 103 is the over okay. overrun. Okay, yeah. 
Oh, okay. Commissioners. Yeah. Oh. <coughs> Come on. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, just to clarify, so Marco C. Martin and the governmental. So just to clarify, 103 is that uh, the bill that would require the hearing for, you know, the, uh, I guess we're in, we're as a, I guess generally we're just calling it, you know, true flat, flat, and, you know, raising the levy. So that's, that's that bill. That's LB 103, and it did pass, and it did pass 4702. <laughs> Which one is? Uh, let me, and I want to clarify too. This is Patrick Bloomingdale. So, my understanding, and Marcos can correct me if I'm wrong, is that's just so it's just a public hearing. Which means if you're going to raise the levy, okay. you have to hit, you have to hold a public hearing. Okay. Which, <laughs> which, okay. or if the valuation increases, you have to have a public hearing. It right. really is not a big deal because okay. you, uh, all you I, do is publish that. The other part of it, my understanding is. Is, right. was not successful and that was the three percent right limit. and that's a three percent cap and that is the that's constitutional the amendment and that um, has not been passed yet and we don't anticipate it to be passed thank you I, I misunderstood I, I misspoke yeah. when I thank said you it. Uh, aha now I have somebody I can blame <laughs> <laughs> never pass off that opportunity yeah, Mike right. doesn't you done right. Chairman yes I'm done Commissioner Boyle uh, yes I, I wanted to um, uh, bring up, uh, I got a report from, uh, well, uh, it was held out. We sent a report about some of the activity of the courts were down. Do you remember that? I passed it on to, I think, uh, to you, uh, Commissioner Borgerson, and also maybe uh, yes. the chair, uh, maybe others too. And I was curious how that all stacks up. If the volume's down, I know that the county attorney and the public defender have increased workloads uh, substantially, but for some reason, uh, the workload of the judges was apparently down. So I don't know what they used, uh, who, who said they needed another one. Um, but uh, I, I th one of the things that I, I've told you that I've done in the past is whenever I, I always sit in the back at the, when we have the big meeting, the governor comes in, so I stand up, so then I get to yell when I want to yell. And I <laughs> yell, you know, take over the cost of the justice system. And the place erupts and claps and everything else. Because if you look at it, it would cover just about, you know, 60% of our budget. It would cover, you know, the, the sheriff's office, the, uh, the jail, uh, the courtrooms, all the rest of it, security, all the things that come make up the justice system would be, you know, the, the cost of the public defender, the cost of the county attorney, all of that, you know, would be a state deal. And that, when you really think about it, that's all we're doing. We're, we have state laws that we're enforcing, and we really are a child of the state. So what is the deal? We're not an enemy. You know, we work together on this. The other thing I, I would really like to talk about this could happen, but it's not politically fun for the governor, uh, is that we take uh, ask him to m stop this distribution of uh, sales tax money, $180 million or whatever it is, uh, and we all get checks for $19.12, and also the corporations all get them, the ones that pay taxes. So, uh, you know, the Costco is getting a check from the state of Nebraska, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, $30,000, $40,000. What does that mean to Costco, not to single them out? I don't even know if that's the right amount. But I used to use Women of the World, but I can't anymore. Um, <laughs> any event, so these corporations are getting this money uh, that I don't want to say they don't need, but it's a windfall in a way. And then all of us are getting, you know, small little checks. Uh, we can buy, when I used to smoke, maybe we could buy half a carton of cigarettes with what you get, you know. I would like to see that money uh, instead dedicated into a fund to pay for the operations of, let's say, <laughs> Uh, the county attorney's office or uh, the judges, some portion of it. And I think we ought to ask the governor to do that. I made an appointment, and I wasn't able to keep it because of circumstances, but I made an appointment with the chief of staff for the governor to talk to him about some tax things, and I never followed through. But I do want to do that because these are seeds we need to plant right at the core. And um, uh, I think that's one thing we ought to be thinking about. Um, so anyway, I bring that up. Those are some things that are practical, but I really appreciate you saying that. What you said, Mr. Borgerson, and I agree with exactly what you're saying. I do think we need to talk to, we shouldn't surprise uh, 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 Senator Lathrop because he has such a good friend, but postpone it to a date certain, maybe that would be the thing to do. You want to clarify something? Uh, yes, Commissioner. So, uh, <clears throat> and excuse me, I, I kind of brought a cold back from D.C. Um, <laughs> um, the uh, just to clarify on LB 309, which this was the Commissioner Borgerson's bill that she, she she's the one that brought brought this item up. 309, as it stands right now, it's on select file, so it's on the floor. It's going to have a hearing on the floor. Um, Legron did refile his amendment. That amendment is AM 471. 
and that amendment would provide the reimbursement, uh, you know, past the way that, um, that, that she specified. So all of that is, is completely accurate. So um, I just, just to let commissioners know that's, that's where it stands right now is with that AM471, which has not been adopted, the bill is on the floor 309 on select file. My understanding, I'm sorry. Uh, hold on, I'll, I'll come back. Okay. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Um, this bill advanced 35 to nothing, and it will advance again. Uh, I, I think that the best that we could do, um, possibly, um, is support the Legron uh, request uh, that the, the state assume paying for these demonstrably state employees. I mean, district court judges are not county employees. They work for the state, they report to the Supreme Court, and I think that's an appropriate thing. That said, you know, that's probably the best we can do, and I wouldn't be too confident that that would go forward. The fiscal note on this, if you look at it, um, is $308,000, and, um, you know, that covers judges' costs, staff costs, period doesn't cover the courtroom costs, doesn't cover the security costs, all the, all the costs that we assume um, and that would be required to put these judges uh, in a judge's okay. chambers in a courtroom okay. um, and, and staff those things, sure. which are considerably more than 308,000. Um, the idea, I think, would be best approached from the point of view of we don't have room right now the Public Building Commission has appropriated funds for a space study of this exact space to propose how we go forward. That hasn't been ex expended and it hasn't been conducted and probably should be before we go through any space expansions. Um, and, I, you know, we've talked about this before, why, why we would even entertain um, going forward with a major annex expansion without the space study being conducted is... Uh, truly cart before the horse. But if we're looking at this in terms of having any effect, I, I think that, you know, an hour from now, presumably when this bill comes before the legislature, uh, the best we could probably expect is to give our legislative lobbyists the go-ahead to support the Legron Amendment and, if possible, work on something in terms of a... Um, time frame to allow us more time, I think this comes on board in 2020, uh, to address these questions of space and expenditure. So I, I'd support a, a motion that, that says that we support LB 309 with the Legron Amendment attached. Uh, you want a clarification? Uh, yes, Commissioner, right. Like Commissioner, Commissioner Kavanaugh sta stated the uh, the fiscal note on it. It is the state is showing a three hundred eight thousand dollar fiscal impact that came from the Nebraska Supreme Court. Oh, we turned in our fiscal impact, which okay. is um, right at. Let me switch screens here. Oh, over two um, million. A little over two million. That's the first year. Yeah, that would be for the first year. So yeah, my my fiscal impact note that I turned in was two point two one mil. Um, that's the first mil, uh, first year, second year, uh, which would be. Tw Question. Year 20, 2021, 20, and that's a 1.2 mil. And that was pretty uh, inclusive, as many groups as I possibly could, including the Sheriff Department, District Court, Public Building Commission, County Attorney, Public Defender, of course, the District Court, and Public Properties. Commissioner Kavanaugh, do you want to follow up? Right. And were we requested for to, to submit a fiscal impact on this? Bill by the fiscal uh, office of the legislature? Yes, I believe we were. And that doesn't appear anywhere in the fiscal note I'm that's sorry. online. Is there some reason that did we did uh, we submit that? Yes, of course it was submitted. Yeah, yeah. So um, um but the Supreme Court yeah, I, I, I'm looking at the same thing online and it looks like only the Supreme Court's um information is on there. Right. But, but yes, it, it was provided and okay. it was provided to the legislative fiscal note office. Um there in at the Capitol. Right. And at the beginning of the session, when this was introduced and heard, did we, did we appear at that hearing? Did we testify at that hearing? Did we do anything? 
No. Commissioner, to answer your question, the answer is no. Uh, the, this, the board did not have a formal position at that point. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Borgeson. Uh, uh, Borgeson. Sorry. Then boy. Borgeson? Borgeson, but um, go ahead because I can't remember what. Oh, I was going to say it's going to be heard at 11 today. That's, okay. that's what I was going to add. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We thank uh, Commissioner Lafong. Um, this is kind of off the wall, but you know, it really is. Uh, I, I don't know what the final plans are, and I should. But uh, what is supposed to be going into the new building? Are we talking about courtrooms? Are we talking about the county attorneys, the public defender? What's going into the new building? And what bothers me is we're going to be spending a million dollars doing a courthouse, a courtroom that I don't know where. It, it, unless we're leaving the judges in that building, I mean, I'm not really sure what, what we're doing. Maybe what we ought to do, this will really make everybody excited, but we should probably, maybe we, we should consider moving the clerk of the district court into the United Way building and then doing the courtroom in that space. I don't know. But what is the plan? Uh, what is the plan for the uh, courthouse as it is? Are we gonna use it for judges and courtrooms and then have the county attorneys and move the back office, so to speak, into other rooms? I, I'm not, that's what I kind of thought we were doing, but. I don't know the plan. Wouldn't that be part of the building commission's wait a minute, wait a minute. space plan? Who are you I'm asking done. to? I'm done. Pardon you, me? You just making a statement or? I'm sorry? I said you just making a statement or are you asking it to? Well, I, I was just build? curious. Yeah, I, was asking, I was asking really what is the plan for that, that building, who's in that building and who's in the new one. And Commissioner uh, Lafong wants to make a comment. <laughs> okay. To be fair though, is that a building, that's a building commission discussion? I don't know if we can have. Well. Is that a? I don't know. I mean, I, th I think the county is going to keep the topic on the, the county is going to drive that. The county is going to drive it, though. We're going to okay. decide okay. who goes where. Okay. So let me. You all got in line. Let me go to Commissioner Duda, Commissioner Borgs, and Commissioner Cavanaugh. Thank you. I, I would like to clarify one more time. Okay. Building Commission has done space studies. Yeah. We've got them on file. We aren't going to waste our time and money doing another space study when nothing has changed yet. There is no intention of doing a space study at this point. The space study proposed is for after we get the new building going, figure out who's going there. Then the building commission says, let's do a space study of who's left and who's best to go into these spaces being vacated. We have no intention of doing another space study now when nothing has changed. So I, I'm tired of hearing that our timing is off, that we should be doing it now. We're not doing another one until something changes. There's no reason to do one until something changes. Thank you. Yes. Commissioner no Borgeson, Cabinet and Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, and I'm glad you clarified that, but to also clarify, from day one, we've talked about juvenile court, county yeah. attorney, public defender, and probation going to the new building. Right. We have already have the designs, yeah. the conversation with them, the square footage, which everybody's gotten, the budget, which everybody's gotten. So that's that. What Commissioner Duda is talking about is that the Building Commission then said, well, then we should have a study on what the space for the existing courthouse, our current courthouse, who goes where when we move these other people out. That to me is a proper way to proceed and to proceed with an additional judge at that time versus now. Commissioner Cavanaugh. Okay, well, I mean, there's fundamental disagreement on do you plan your work and work your plan or do you work your plan and then plan your work. It would make all the sense of the world to take the $250,000 that the Building Commission has dedicated to a space study and conduct that study before new space is constructed or new things happen, and you can anticipate that new things will happen. Uh, the proposals that have been before this board uh, regarding alternatives to the uh, current state of uh, affairs with a courthouse annex, with moving county attorney and public defender and probation, um, all are forms of space studies. So we know pretty much that things are going to happen. We know pretty much if we build an annex what's going to go into it. Uh, there's general agreement on building that annex. Not having a space study before that goes forward is just backwards in the worst possible way. So you can say as much as you want that we have no intention to do a space study until we build a building, 
but no one in the real world operates like that. And the, the question keeps coming up, like the building commission hasn't already anticipated this by appropriating the money. The money's there, do the study, act like you know, you know what you're doing, rather than putting a cart before the horse, not planning anything until we build something, and then plan it backwards, uh, which will, uh, you know, not work well and probably cost us more money. It's just absurd. Okay. Uh, well, we have in the order here, and then we'll try to see where the board's at to be in the spirit of this is Commissioner Kraft, Duda, and then Morgan. I'll ask the board what he wants to do. Commissioner Kraft. Yes, uh, perhaps I'm illusional, but I do think I live in the real world. Uh, we did rather recently a very intensive space study, mm -hmm. and that was for the juvenile court judge. So we have, and, and there's no sense spending $250,000 on a study until we have financing and everything in place to start construction, along with the fact that construction will easily take one to two years, or three years. Okay, I just got the finger, three years. Um, that's plenty of time to figure out how we're gonna use the space we're vacating. So to spend $250,000 prior to the need to spend it, because there's something called the cost of money is, in my opinion, foolish. So perhaps we live in different universes. Uh, I will say this, you know, you, you like to beat dead horses. After you finish beating the horse and you know it's not going to go anywhere, you should dismount. So, uh, you know, that's just, I don't know what your fascination is with dead horses. Uh, Mr. Duda, Morgan. I'll be happy to, thank you, Mr. Chair, I'll be happy to get anybody a copy of the latest space studies that we have done, but we've seen ideas of what the new courthouse annex would look like, but we also have very active forces in our own midst trying to fight it, trying to change it, trying to prevent it, saying let's do this instead. I have no interest in spending another $250,000 for another space study when we've already got one on the books until we know what we're doing. To say the space study has to guide us is ridiculous. Politics is guiding us, pure and simple. Space study has very little to do with it. We'll do a space study once this board figures out what we're doing to address our space crunch. And I have no intention of doing another space study until then. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Morgan passes. Are we? What's the action of the board? Is it a It is? Um, it, it, Commissioner, I'm paraphrasing, but basically Commissioner Duda made a motion to ask the legislator to hold off on LB 309, if you will, and okay. Borgeson seconded. Okay, I didn't know that was official. So, okay, there's a motion to second uh, by Commissioner but, but, Duda and seconded by Commissioner Borgeson. Mr. So, Chair, if I may. Yes. Please. Commissioner, would you mind restating it? Because I know I didn't probably Mr. state Chair, it Mr. Chair, if, if I may try to state it more accurately, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think that our stand would be that we ask the legislature to delay implementation of 309 until we have space available. You got a clarification? And the, just on the amendment as well, what, whatever is... Well, that's not there yet. Just hold on. Do. Hold just, on. Okay. So right now the only thing on the floor is uh, it's three or nine. you got to clear. You got to clarify, it, Mr. Clerk. Uh, you got to. Yeah. He, and that is to hold off, uh, to hold off on till there's space, basically. And and support the amendment. We should have that in there as well. We do support the amendment. Okay. Okay. That's. Yeah. When we when we do the actual resolution, we'll listen to this part of the meeting to make sure we get exactly <laughs> how you had it. Good luck. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a motion second. Please vote. Motion passes seven to zero. Uh, with that, nothing else. I have something. Sorry, Commissioner uh, Boyle. Yes, I want to take a moment to uh, uh, acknowledge and recognize uh, a uh, distinguished member of county government among us, and that's uh, Commissioner Mary Ann Borgeson, who's now the first vice president of NACO. And uh, she's moving on up to 
quote the television show, move on up. <laughs> She's coming on up, and uh, she does have uh, big shoes to fill. Phil, what size do you wear, Chris? Yeah, that, that, anyway, yeah. so I, I, we're, I I'm very excited. I have to put both my feet in his. <laughs> very excited about what you've done and what you're doing and where you're headed, so I really... Uh, I offer congratulations to you personally, and I, I, I feel the, the rest of the board does as well. We're very proud of you. Indeed. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. With That's that, there's two items for executive session litigation and real estate. You got one more? Sorry. Go back. Well, uh, just a, another a point of privilege, Mr. Chair. Please. Um, we, during our, our conference in uh, D.C., um, we also um, have had many discussions here as well about the 5G and um, the broadband expansion of um, technology. And one of the things that NACO did was they developed a app on your phone called Testit, T-E-S-T-I-T. -E and what it does is you download that app and you perform a test to see how fast where you are, how fast you are downloading um, in that area. The reason is, is because the only maps that they have in regards to 5G were developed through the vendors. And those vendors would do things such as, um, if I would test right here in this area and, and I was okay, that would mean that whole zip code is okay. But we know for a fact that that's not the case because in the state of Maryland, we know that just within zip codes, there's a difference. So NACO took it upon them themselves to create this app. It's, and all, again, all you have to do is go to the app store, download it, and what they're doing is gathering this information um, so that we can provide information as to really, in real time, what, what is going on with um, the speed. So anyway, I would encourage everybody, I would encourage our county deputies um, to download it on their phones and wherever they are within the county to just test it as they go along. Um, again, the more data we have that we can give our national um, folks um, to make their argument, the better. So um, again, the deputies would be a perfect example as they're um, out and about across the county um, to help us out with this. So, uh, Mike, I'll help you download it on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that. We'll remove the frame. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, with that, um, there is need for executive session for two so items. Moved. Do we make a motion? Yeah. There's a motion to go into executive session by Commissioner Boyle, seconded by Commissioner Duden. We're going in for litigation and personnel. Um, there's a motion to second. Please vote. And we're going in for litigation and personnel. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Motion passes 7 to 0.
Commissioner Kavanaugh, are you a yes? Yep. And Commissioner Boyle? I emailed them, yes. Okay. So Good to go. I got to make a run real quick. I'll be back. Okay. All right. Motion passes. All commissioners present voting yes. Yes. 